Presented by Caltech. So we've been talking about traveling waves and in particular most recently about boundary conditions uh, uh, which impose discontinuities. There are various kinds of discontinuities. It can be that the wave reaches the end of something and something happens. Uh, or it can be that the medium itself kind of changes character. And so I have a few demonstrations to demonstrate both of those aspects here. Last time we demonstrated on a uh, 40 meter transmission line, a cable, uh, where we could see whether the peaks uh, bounced back in a positive way, bounced back in a negative way, or just got absorbed at the end, depending on how I terminated the cable. Uh, but we can do this same kind of thing mechanically. And so that's what I have here with this wave machine. I can send the pulse down the machine and see what happens at the end. So let me do that. So it'll be positive. Start on your side. So there's a pulse going down. And it kind of disappeared at the end. Well, that's because I have something like the resistor that I had on the transmission line. I've got this device at the end, which is just a dash pot. And so that's, that was adjusted to be at roughly the critical damping place, so the pulse just got absorbed uh, by depositing the energy in that. So without that, I should expect something different to happen. And so I always have trouble seeing these things. But if you watch carefully and see what happens at the end there, I'm going to make it positive here and see what happens at the end when it comes back. It came back positive. So the either it's going positive forward, kind of positive coming back. So that is an unconstrained N. It's like we had the open circuit. Uh, and with the open circuit, the pulse came, went down positive. It came back positive. If I clamp the end, then I put a different boundary condition on the end. And now I put the boundary condition that X is 0 at the end. Just like when I put a short on the transmission line, I had the voltage had to be zero at the end, so that the returning pulse and the incoming pulse had to cancel each other out. So we should expect the same kind of thing here. We should expect the pulses to cancel out. Let's see what happens. So it goes negative. Because this, this is constrained to zero, so to get zero, you have to have, if I put in a positive pulse, it's got to have a negative pulse coming back to cancel it out. OK. <clears throat> so that's um, the simple boundary condition at the end of either I critically damp or, I mean, of course, I could have done it non-critically damped, and it would have been somewhere intermediate. but. Uh, I did sort of the three extremes on this. Um, so I could have discontinuities of a different kind, and I have to analyze them a little bit differently. But it's basically the same, same thing. Um, I have, just like last week, I have this rubber hose that I can send a pulse along, except you see there's a discontinuity there. That is, the medium is changing in a discontinuous way over towards the right. And so if I send a pulse down, remember when, last week when I did this, I sent the pulse down and it bounced back and forth, back and forth in a pretty nice way. That discontinuity is really uh, affecting things, such that my pulse, it does propagate through, but there's a piece that gets reflected, too. 
So at that discontinuity, if I look closely at what happens when the pulse reaches it, I hope you can see that on the first one, first go at least, that there's a part that gets transmitted and then a part that gets reflected at the discontinuity. And then as these things bounce back and forth, with no particular uh, length phase relationship to them, uh, it quickly becomes kind of noisy. And you know, it's because we're superimposing the original pulse that's going through, part of it's transmitted, part of it's reflected, then it, they each bounce back from their respective ends and they superimpose on this in an in almost random way. And so it kind of cancels out the, uh, uh, the nice clean pulse that goes along. And so this is something we'll analyze uh, eventually uh, with uh, uh, see what part gets transmitted and part, what part gets reflected. But it's really the same kinds of boundary conditions uh, in a different setting as, as what we've been looking at here. So I have another example of kind of the same thing here. I have a wave machine and I have another wave machine. They're coupled together. Uh, and they're different. So I should expect that at this discontinuity, something's going to happen. It's not going to be just the pulse is going to propagate nice and cleanly all the way down. It's going to be just like the hose. Something's going to happen here. There'll be something that gets transmitted, but there'll be something that gets reflected here too. So let me try sending a pulse down. Maybe that's too small. Let me try a bigger one, see if I can do it without. And it quickly kind of randomizes, just like the hose did. Because there's no particular uh, uh, standing wave that I'm setting up here. You see some of it got reflected and some of it transmitted down. Same sort of thing. Um, it's not the only kind of system. So we've, I mean, we've had an electrical system with a transmission line. We have hoses. We have a wave machine. Uh, as we get further now into the course, we're going to talk more and more about light waves. Uh, and so we can see the same kinds of things going on there. I want to point out that in light waves, um, the book does a fair amount on light waves, but the, they, they don't actually tell you too much about the fundamentals, about how uh, things are derived from Maxwell's equations. So there's actually a note posted on the, on the course website that's supposed to help you, uh, help remind you about what you learned in Physics 1 or maybe didn't get in Physics 1 uh, about electromagnetic waves uh, that hopefully will be helpful. So, light waves. So I have some light waves here. Let me turn them on. You probably can't see them, so let me put the camera on it. Should be coming on, and let me go to uh, darken the room. Okay, so we see it on both cameras. So all I have, so there's a set of, of uh, five laser beams here, going in parallel. They're hitting a plastic block here, which I can change the angle of. And, and so we'll, we'll look at this some more, but the, the only thing I want to observe at the moment is that the light wave's coming in from here. It's hitting the block. And you can just see there's a piece that's got reflected and a piece that's transmitted all the way through to the other side. There's actually, on the other interface here, there's another beam that you can see. If you look closely, you can see another beam that's reflected back from the plastic. So, so this is just a wave 
that's hitting a discontinuity. Some of it's getting reflected, and some of it's getting transmitted. When, and there are two discontinuities here, so it's happening, happening twice. And so again, we should be able to work out sort of what part of the wave gets reflected, what part gets transmitted. And this all has to do with the boundary conditions of what happens at that interface. And the electromagnetic note that I've posted uh, uh, discusses the boundary conditions in the case of electromagnetic waves. So, so we've been discussing traveling waves, uh, and we're going to now talk about <coughs> standing waves. which aren't really so different. I mean, they're both kinds of waves that are uh, doing somewhat different things, but, but basically it's all waves. Um, and the feature that makes standing waves maybe a little different is, is, is all in the normal modes we've been looking at. So we're basically going to be looking at normal modes again. So uh, there are various ways of demonstrating this. Uh, we've got a new toy here, so let me demonstrate it with this. It's called a Rubens tube. So I just have a propane tank down here. It's okay, it's okay. Fire marshal standing by. And I'm just going to light it. And turn it down a little bit. It's a little windy in here. You guys are breathing awfully heavy. We'll try this. Okay, so I, so, okay, it's a tube with a bunch of holes that has propane coming out of each hole and it's lit, so it's burning. Nothing much happening. There's a membrane on the end which I can do things with, and a speaker that's aimed at that membrane. So I can look at sound waves and hopefully get standing waves in this tube. It's a certain length, the velocity of sound is a certain velocity. So depending on what frequency I got, I can get an even number of wavelengths in this tube or not. And, see, and, and I should be able to see it by how that flame looks. enough. It's really gotten windy in here. Let's see. So right now this is 388 hertz and you can see that there is a nice standing pattern there. lower and kind of mess it up. Go through that. Let's try going higher. It's uh, okay, maybe that's even better. Yeah, that's that's really got so the places where it's at a minimum are called uh, called nodes if you like and the maximum are called anti nodes. And so it's got a pretty good ratio of of height in here, so I'm, I'm pretty well tuned now. It's almost 400 hertz. Uh, I should be able to go higher and see more structure develop. So I've, I've, I've hit another standing, standing wave pattern here. Not sure how far I can push this. Probably need a little more juice. Oh, that's pretty nice. 
So it's just the way, I'm just changing the wavelengths, so I'm fitting different numbers of wavelengths in this. Of course, there's some boundary conditions uh, at the ends. The, you know, the pressure, when it's a solid end at the other end, it's, uh, the pressure can't, can't change. Okay, so percussion does something uh, dramatic. And every now and then you can see a tone with a standing wave pattern in it. Okay. <clears throat> Enough of that, okay. and that will eventually burn out. <clears throat> okay, so we'll have some other de demonstrations of standing waves, but that's kind of a cute one. <clears throat> so any questions on any of these? So I'm gonna start doing analysis now. So, standing waves. So, so we talked a little bit about superposition. And that's basically what standing waves are. It's a superposition of, if left and right make sense in the context, it's a superposition of left and right waves. Uh, and the most dramatic effects you get is when you're in some kind of a normal mode of the system. So we also have the notion of normal modes being important. <clears throat> so normal modes are a terrific way, as we'll see, to analyze things. And you can get general waves as a superposition of normal modes. So the idea is that the general motion of a system <coughs> is a superposition of normal modes. So the idea is going to be that we can describe any particular state of our system, of our, of our wave, uh, as our, our fundamental normal modes adding together in some linear way. <clears throat> so the text does standing waves on a string, and, and we'll actually demonstrate that uh, next time. <clears throat> Well, let's try a different analogous system. We've been looking at coaxial cables, so let's try that. Um, so let's try a cable, call it a coaxial cable, a transmission line, <clears throat> with some speed, which we'll call V. And let's assume there are no losses. Let's take, so now let's put boundary conditions on the ends. And for a standing wave, the boundary condition that uh, maybe is easiest to think about at least is just to short out both ends. <clears throat> so I have the notion that I have So this is meant to be an outer conductor and an inner conductor in some coaxial arrangement, maybe. Um, the whole thing, maybe length 
L, and I've shorted out the ends. So this is, we'll put a coordinate system, x equals 0, x equals L. <coughs> so what's the boundary condition if we're shorted out? Well, the voltage has to be zero there, the voltage between the inner and the outer conductor. So, okay, I try to make my velocity a small v and my voltage a big V. I hope that's a, maybe I'll make it a little more script. <coughs> Uh, okay, so, and then in between, at some time t, we can have some arbitrary function that the voltage is some arbitrary function of position as long as it goes to zero at the ends. And so it might look like this. So I'm going to draw, say, the voltage as a function of x. So x is 0 here, it's L here, so it's got to go to 0 at those two ends, but it might look like, let's see, so it goes to 0, and it might do something funny. Hopefully I've drawn it single valued. Okay some arbitrary complicated shape with the boundary conditions that it's zero at the two ends. Okay, so at some time t I have v of x looking like this. So this is v of x at some given time t. And the question is, how does this voltage evolve with time. Maybe at time t equals zero, that's, what I, that's the voltage I put on my wire. Okay. If I then just watch it, how does that voltage evolve with time? <clears throat> well, I have, a, I have an equation. I have a wave equation. I know that my voltage satisfies a wave equation, so let me use it. We derived that before. So let's see. So let's consider the wave equation. <coughs> d squared by d, d squared by dt squared of the voltage function of position in time is just equal to the velocity squared, d squared by dx squared of v and x and t. And I have the boundary conditions again. So I have a differential equation, partial differential equation with boundary conditions that v of 0 and t and v at L and T is equal to zero. So these boundary conditions hold for all time because I'm shorted for all time. So let me not start with something complicated. Let me start with something simple. We've been talking about sinusoidal solutions to our wave equation, and that makes a good starting point. The, and the notion is that we're going to be able to make complicated things like that out of sinusoidal waves, but we'll get to that. So let's consider a sinusoidal solution. So 
So I'm going to let v of x and t be a wave going to the right and a wave going to the left. And so we argued last time that this was uh, you know, a left-going wave and a right-going wave would make the most general solution. Of course, this isn't the most general solution, it's, but it's of that form of a wave going to the left, a wave going to the right. It's just a sinusoid. <clears throat> Where, okay, let's see. So omega squared over k squared is the speed of the wave squared. Um, and then I need to satisfy my boundary conditions. So I've got a solution. It's got two unknown constants. It's got k's and omegas. I need to make my boundary conditions satisfied. And so that's going to that's gonna be additional information. So I need to satisfy... Uh, usually you pick the one with x equals zero first because the algebra gets too hard if you if you don't do the simple things first. So set, putting it at x equals zero makes it look nice and simple. So let's do that. E to the minus i omega t plus b b times e to the i omega t, and that's equal to zero by my boundary condition. <clears throat> OK, so at this point, uh, maybe it's useful to separate into real and imaginary parts, because both the real and the imaginary parts separately have to be 0 here. So let's let A Let's replace A with a real number A and a phase. And likewise, let's replace B with a real number B times a phase factor, where I'm going to pick A and B are real, and alpha and beta are real. Uh, and a and b are greater than or equal to zero. So I'm putting all the phase into the phase factor. So alpha and beta run between zero and two pi, say. OK, so now <coughs> with that, I get v of zero and t. I'm going to simplify my life in a little bit. But let me just write down the general phases first. Uh, e to the minus, um, so minus i omega t with a minus i o alpha, so I'll put it as omega t uh, plus alpha with an i out front. Okay, and then the b term is plus b e to the i omega t plus beta. So I've defined my alphas and beta phases in a particular way with the signs just for convenience. Of course, they go from 0 to pi, so the, so the, the plus or minus uh, is included. OK, so in terms of real and imaginary parts, so the real part of this first term is cosine omega t plus alpha. <coughs> the real part of the second term is omega t plus beta. And the imaginary parts, i times, so I'm going to get a minus, uh, the i's I took out, sine omega t plus alpha. Oh, I forgot to put the cosine in there. That 
Oh, it's probably confusing you. Okay. Plus a B sine omega t. Oh, let's see. What did I do here? Beta plus uh, beta. So the real part is equal to 0 is just equal to uh, the first part here, a cosine omega t plus alpha plus b cosine omega t plus beta. So that's got to be equal to 0. So I have a relation between A and B that depends on alpha and beta here. Um, this has to be true for all time. So you pick the simplest time you can think of. equals 0. And I get that 0 is equal to a cosine alpha plus b cosine beta. So I can solve for b in terms of a in the phases, for example. Let's make our lives simpler for the sake of this example. Of course, we could work out the general case and see what happens. Uh, but let's work it out for the case of this example. Um, and you can, you, know, you can think about what happens in general. I'll let you think about it. Let's just consider alpha equals beta equals 0. Let's just suppose my phase factors are 0. In that case, then, we have 0 is a, a plus b, and so then b is just equal to minus a. And so then we have, yeah? Uh, I have two questions. In the imaginary part of your expression, should it be an a sine? Yes. OK, thank you. The, the well, no, I mean, in, in principle, I could set the phases arbitrarily. Uh, in fact, as we work it out, you know, maybe I have some constraints. But, but uh, as far as we know, we could set them arbitrarily. I just wanted to write down a general equation first. And then I'm just going to simplify my life by setting them equal to 0. But in principle, these coefficients up there are complex in the top line. In principle, those are complex, which I can write as an amplitude times a phase factor. I can write an arbitrary complex number as a times e to the i alpha or minus i alpha. So maybe I shouldn't do this. Maybe I shouldn't do the general case because it seems to be, maybe it's confusing. But uh, I just wanted to show that, you know, we could in principle deal with general situation. But I don't want to. I think I just got confused because it looked like A and B were always real. But if they're complex. Yeah, they weren't always real at the very top. I, I, I put it, I used an arrow there to indicate I'm going to replace whatever A was by that um, and use the same notation a okay that's confusing okay but uh, yeah you got it now <clears throat> um, okay so we're, we're going to 
do that. And, and so then what are we left with? We're left with v of x and t. Uh, so v of x and t was somewhere way up there. And we just have the real part is a cosine kx minus omega t from my right going piece minus v is equal to minus a. So I'll take the a outside minus cosine kx plus omega t. So this, the way I've done things here, this is an equal superposition of a left wave and a right wave. And, uh, and we've got them to cancel out at x equals 0. Uh, but what about We have another boundary condition at x equals l. We have to satisfy that. There's nothing that we've done, at least that we think we've done, that, that guarantees that that's going to work. So let's see. Uh, let's see how if we can satisfy this. So it's useful to use the identity cosine of a plus b, you can see there's a cosine of the sum of two different terms, is equal to cosine a cosine b minus sine a sine b, just our usual trig identity. And if we do that, we can write v of x and t as, uh, well, okay, it's kind of a mess, but it's not that bad. It just takes a lot of writing cosine kx, cosine omega t, so I'm just using this identity on this, plus, because there's a minus there, sine kx, sine omega t, and then for the other one, we have a minus cosine kx, cosine omega t, and then we have a minus times the minus here is a plus, sine kx, sine omega t. So this is just equal to 2 times a times sine kx sine omega t. So that's going to be 0 at, uh, at x equals l. And so what does that tell us? So zero is equal to sine KL sine omega T, where I've just divided out the A. I assume A is non-zero, okay? So therefore, sine KL is equal to 0. So L is given. So this puts a constraint on what K can be, what our wave number can be. So K can only take on certain values for us to be able to satisfy this boundary condition. Well, K equals 0 certainly works, but that's kind of a trivial solution. Pi over L works, uh, and then uh, just n pi over L. So forth. OK, so if we drop the trivial solution, This is for non-trivial solutions. Of course, v, v equal to 0 is a perfectly good solution. But it's uh, not very interesting. So, so what do we have? So we have, um, 
we have waves that look like this. Here's zero, here's L. <clears throat> so if n is equal to one, then, um, then we just get one half wavelength between the two, the two ends. Okay. So that's n equals 1. If n equals 2, we get a full wavelength. k is 2 pi over L, and so forth. We get an even, I mean, we get an integer number of half wavelengths between our two boundaries where n tells you how many of them there are, how many half wavelengths there are. So, so this is at some time t. Of course, as t evolves, these move up and down and, and, and oscillate back and forth. So as a function of, as a function of time, between 0 and L, this fundamental, say, goes, you know, at one time t, it's the way I've shown it. Another time t, it's like that. Another time t, it's like that. Another time t, it's like that. So different t. <clears throat> OK. So so we have the speed of the wave, which is the property of the medium, is omega over k. So if k is quantized, by which I mean takes on discrete values, then so is the frequency omega. Just like in quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is all about waves. This is the kind of thing that quantization in quantum mechanics comes from. It comes from boundary conditions. Okay. But we digress. So if k is quantized as k sub n, where k sub n is defined as n pi over L, then omega also has particular values, just given by v times k sub n, or n pi times v over l, again for n equals 1, 2, and so forth. Notice that V over L, this quantity here, is just the time to get from x equals 0 to x equals L. It's, it's the time it takes for, say, a pulse to get from one end of our cable to the other end. Um, with the speed v. <clears throat> so we we so we have a set of different frequencies now, and so now we can see what all our normal modes are. <clears throat> we have a set of standing waves.
or we could just call them normal modes. So let me write that over here. So I'm going to write it in this way. So I'm going to write the nth normal mode. So the voltage in the nth normal mode between the two conductors is I'm going to put an end label on my coefficient a sine n pi x over l for the x dependence. So I put in uh, kx, k sub nx sine n pi v over l times t. More generally, I could add a phase factor here. Uh, but I can't here. I can't do it here because that would violate the boundary conditions then. But in terms of time, I could have any phase I want. <clears throat> Let's see. Let's just notice the following. We said k sub n is n pi over L. But that's just 2 pi divided by the wavelength. K is 2 pi over the wavelength. The wave number is 2 pi divided by the wavelength. And so that tells us that the wavelength, and, I, and I've labeled the wavelength with the same n as the k, okay? So that says the wavelength is 2 times L divided by n. So as you go to higher n values, the wavelength decreases. So you go to higher n values, the wavelength is getting smaller. So it all hangs together. <clears throat> so that's the wavelength of our nth standing wave. And it makes sense. <clears throat> uh, and also let me just note that in terms of of the inductance, and capacitance, where both of these are per unit length. Sometimes you have to remind yourself that I defined L and C in terms of being per unit lengths when you're, when you're checking your units. So in terms of uh, inductance and capacitance per unit length, V is 1 over square root of LC. Yeah, remember, when we just had an LC circuit, a lumped LC circuit, tank circuit. 1 over the square root of LC was a natural frequency. But so they'll get confused because now L and C are per unit length. And so, OK, we have the 1 over time still, but there's now a, a length that comes to the top. So it's, so it has units of velocity. And in fact, from our wave equation, we derived that that's what the velocity is. We did that last time. And so omega sub n, then, the frequency of the nth standing wave, the angular frequency, is n pi over L times 1 over square root of LC, because that's V. Uh, or the, or uh, the frequency is just divide that by 2 pi, right? So if you want to calculate it in cycles per second or hertz, uh, the frequency is that. So that's a new. <coughs> OK. So the point now is going to be that a general wave is just a superposition of, 
of these guys. The problem is linear. Let me show you that the problem is linear. Okay. So we have superposition. So we can put waves on top of each other. We can put linear combinations. That's because the wave equation d squared v by dt squared minus v squared d squared v by dx squared equals 0 is linear. So let's demonstrate that. Let's see what we mean. It means that if we have two solutions, say V1 and V2, two different solutions for the voltage for this wave, for, for this wave equation, then if it's linear, then any linear combination A V1 plus B V2 is also a solution. Let's just go through it once and for all and check. Make sure that's really true. So we have D squared by DT squared. So I'm going to plug this linear combination into my wave equation and see that it satisfies the wave equation if V1 and V2 do. V squared, D squared by DX squared of A V1 plus B V2. Okay, well, differentiation is a linear operator. I could pull constants through it. The derivative of a sum is the sum of the derivatives. So I can just immediately do this. So this is equal to A D squared by DT squared of v1 plus b d squared by dt squared of v2 minus uh, a v squared d squared by dx squared of uh, v1 minus b v squared d squared by dx squared of v2. And now all I do is rearrange terms. So that expression now is equal to A times D squared by DT squared of V1 minus V squared D squared by DX squared of V1 plus B d squared by dt squared of v1 uh, minus v squared d squared by dx squared of, uh, sorry, this should be v2 of v2. Did I get it all right? I think so. Okay. It's a minus sign. But V1 satisfies the wave equation. So this is 0. V2 satisfies the wave equation.